Hello, this is Jeffrey Booth for the Stories for My Lights YouTube channel. Now we haven't done a story for a while because I have been reading to Alden every night on Skype, but I just felt like it was time to make a new video for this channel just for the fun of it. So here we go. Now many of you might know the legend of the sword in the stone. Perhaps the King Arthur version, perhaps another version featuring other characters. But what many of you may not know is that there was more to the story of the Sword in the Stone. Much, much more. And today, we're here to go over that story. So long ago, as you may have known, there was a great kingdom. Some called it Camelot, others had other names for it. But what we do know is that it was a kingdom of justice, a kingdom with a king and knights and the council who cared very much for their people. And there was at the head of it a king, some called him King Arthur, some called him King Horus, some called him King Shadab Uglosh Terbada. The name isn't important. What is important is that he was one of the greatest leaders of men that had ever been recorded in all of history. And while he lived, his nation, his people, his kingdom were prosperous and safe and happy. But as with all things, both good and the bad, they must come to an end. And so did the life of King Arthur. And as he lay dying, he prayed upon the fairies and the witches and the gods of his realm to grant him one wish. And his wish was for that whoever held his sword, some would call it Excalibur, but it had many names, for whoever held his sword to be the rightful king or queen of Camelot. And he went outside to a massive stone one so large and so hard that none could break through it, neither with chisel, nor explosives, nor weapons or pickaxes. And once more he prayed to the gods and said, let this for sword be forever protected until one who is such worthy comes forth to claim it. And with all his might, he smashed his sword into the stone and it slid in like butter with a blue glow. And once it was in up to the hilts, the rock hardened around it and Arthur could not move the sword. Knowing that his legacy was safe, he fell down the rock, slid to the ground, and died. Now in the kingdom, there was much mourning for the loss of Arthur. And everyone at the start was very good and lived on in his image and did the best to preserve his legacy. But as the memory of his funeral faded and the candled boats that they had used to say him goodbye went down the river into memory, men did as men do. Some were wise, some were good, some were corrupt. But there were many who were greedy and wanted the kingdom for their own. So they started fighting for Camelot. Those who wished to be on the round table fought bloody battles. Those who wished to be king fought battles both of politics and word and unfortunately of armies and warfare. Until before long, the realm of Camelot was torn asunder and was forgotten and erased from memory in all but tale and all but legend. That brings us to the present day in England, in a town much like the town that you and I live in. There was in the town square, above the ancient ruins of an old castle, the biggest novelty and tourist attraction in this town, the Sword of Camelot. There was a plaque at the bottom of the stone that said, can you remove this sword from the stone? If so, you shall be the rightful king of our empire. And every tourist who visited this town would try to pull the sword free. And of course, none, no matter how large or small, how strong or frail, could budge it, could make it move a millimeter, a nanometer, whatever is smaller than a nanometer. And so thousands and thousands of people got their pictures taken with the stone, trying to pull it free, pretending to be impaled by it, but none moved it or budged it. But now we join a young man named Altar. Now Altar had always loved the story of King Arthur. He had loved the story of Lancelot, the Round Table, the Lady of the Lake, Morgan Le Fay, all of these characters. But not only that, he loved the idea that there was a true king, one who would take care of his people and always act with honor and with integrity. And naturally, when he turned 16 years old and his parents said, 
we've got a huge tax refund and we're gonna take you on a trip anywhere you want. I think you might imagine where he chose to go. So they boarded a plane from their small city in Colorado and flew all the way to England, to this small village where they were going to see Sword in the Stone. Now, this wasn't the first thing they did on their trip. Altar, they went to see old castles, including the old castle that may have once been Camelot. They went and explored the beautiful countryside. They even went to London and rode the tubes and the subway around and saw all the sights and sounds. But on the last day, the most important day, they went to the sword and Altar just stared at it. The hilt of the sword was beautiful without flaw. It had been there for at least a thousand years, yet it was mired with no rust, no gold, no moss, no patina, nothing. It was as good as new. And so he walked up to it, and of course his parents took a photo of him, pretending to pull it out, and him standing to the side of it, and pretending the sword was rammed through his chest with ketchup on his shirt, and all of the usual tourist things. And finally, he laid his hand upon the hilt. He felt a tingle run up and jolt his arm and run all the way through his body and come out his feet into the earth. Ooh, that was the strangest feeling static electricity I've ever felt, Altar said to himself. Then he grabbed on, he pulled the sword and it slid out. No harder than pulling a knife from a stick of butter or pulling a sword from its sheath. Everyone in the town square stopped and looked at him. There were several gasps and then it was quiet. The only thing you could hear was the sound of a bird and a buzzard in the distance. Altar's hand began glowing. His clothes began glowing. The sword began glowing. And then he disappeared from existence. He was no longer in the village. His parents were, of course, quite alarmed and quite freaked out. They didn't know what to do, so they ran and they told the police. But that is a story for another time, for what we need to do is follow Altar. And so as you can imagine, Altar felt quite strange as he winked in and out of existence. And he appeared inside of a castle, behind bars. He was in jail. Excalibur was in his hand, for he decided to think of his sword as Excalibur. He yelled, where am I? And he heard footsteps, but nobody responded. The footsteps clopped, clop. Clop, 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 ever closer to his prison cell. As they got louder, he could hear the sound of breathing as if somebody was wheezing as the breath went in and out of their nose. And finally, in front of him stood a man who was quite old, in fact, older than any man that Altar had ever seen, wearing long black robes with strands of purple running throughout. The old man looked at him with piercing blue eyes, the kind of eyes that you could never tell a lie to, and said, well, I see the old sword has come home to roost. Now who are you, boy? And he said the word boy with a sneer that Altar did not much care for. Altar introduced himself and told the man in the robe what had just happened. And the man said, well, I guess you can assume who I am then. Altar said, Merlin? And the man said, well, yes, at one time I was Merlin. But you see, the years have changed me. The years have changed us. And you'll find that those stories that you heard are nothing like reality. Altar did not like the way that Merlin talked. In the stories, Merlin was always a jovial, happy, friendly wizard. But this man seemed bitter and spiteful and condescending. Merlin looked at Altar and said, give me the sword, boy. We can save ourselves much time. Pass it through the bars. I'll send you back to where you came from. And this can be done once and for all without any need for bloodshed. Altar again did not like the idea that there would be a need for bloodshed. That made him quite terrified. But he knew that he could not give the sword to this man. So he refused. No, Merlin, this sword will not be yours. I drew it. Rightfully, it belongs to me. And I'm going to set what is going wrong here straight. And Merlin just laughed and said, <laughs> We'll see, boy. And he raised his fingertips and wiggled them at Altar. 
and out zapped tiny bolts of lightning, which hit Altar, froze up his muscles, and caused him to black out. He woke up some time later, how long he could not say, laying on the floor, his hand resting on the hilt of Excalibur. He woke up quite thirsty and quite hungry, but in his jail cell, there was no food and there was no water. Later that day, Merlin came by and said, I'll give you one more chance. Just give me the sword and you can leave. You can go home back to your family. And this can all be done with. Altar didn't dignify it with a response. He merely said, please, please Merlin, may I have food and water? I'm incredibly hungry. I'm incredibly thirsty. And Merlin just laughed to himself and shambled down the hall quietly. Altar was starting to get very hungry and very thirsty. He didn't know what was gonna happen to him. So he reasoned the best thing he could do was go to sleep, conserve his energy, and hope for a better tomorrow. Tomorrow came and his hunger and his thirst grew desperate. Merlin came once more and asked him to hand the sword over, to which he refused. He was growing desperate now. He reached his hand out of the barred window to his back, hoping to catch a raindrop or two that he could lick off his hand. But the sky was blue and cloudless. He looked all around the jail cell for any sign of moisture, but he couldn't find any. He was truly growing desperate. Merlin came back that night and said, would you really like to give me that sword? And he held out a mug of water. This can be yours if only you give me the sword. Inside of Altar, he wanted nothing more than to reach out, grab that water, quench his thirst and go home. But he knew he couldn't. And so he merely shook his head no, and Merlin snorted and left. The next morning, Altar was startled awake by water splashing over his face. He rose to his feet, stood up and looked around, and he saw Merlin standing before him. But he wasn't wearing the same dark purple robes as he was before. He was wearing a beautiful robe of blue lined with the most metallic gold that Altar had ever seen. Strapped to a belt around his waist was a sheath that contained a beautiful golden sword. But the strangest thing was Merlin had a smile upon his face. He took out an old rusty key, opened the door, and signaled for Altar to come out. Altar said, I don't understand what's happening. And Merlin grinned at him. We just had to be sure, boy. The situation is far too serious for us to risk on someone without the fortitude and heart to do what's right. You demonstrated to me, to us, that you were willing to do what is right, even if it means harm to you, perhaps even death. And that is what we need. Come, come. He passed a mug of water to Altar, who drank so fast, not all the water was going in his mouth, it was dribbling down his chin onto his clothes. Come, come. And uh, Merlin walked down the hallway and Altar followed. The first place Merlin took Altar was a beautiful hot spring that was built into the castle. He said, enjoy yourself. And he let Altar relax into the hot spring, get the kinks out of his muscles and clean his body, for he had grown quite dirty being in that prison cell for so long. When he was done, he put on a royal purple robe and left the hot spring, and he found a Merlin waiting outside. Come, I'll show you to your rooms. Merlin guided him to a room in the castle, which was huge. The floors were covered with royal red carpets. There was a giant four-post bed with golden curtains hanging from it. Upon the wall were halberds, bows and arrows, spears, gold chalices, all the treasure that you could imagine. And Merlin said, this is your home, my king. Altar said, my king? And Merlin said, you've heard the stories, right? And Altar shook his head and said, yes, but I didn't know they were true. And Merlin said, well, you are the king. However, I must say that you're gonna find this situation not as pleasant as you were expecting because we need a king now, not to run a kingdom that is healthy and safe and secure, but to run a kingdom that is falling apart, that is besieged by enemies on all sides, that is under attack from friend and foe. We will need your wisdom, your counsel, your bravery, and your strength of your arm. Rest, sleep, for tomorrow a new life for you begins. We need you fresh and strong and powerful. And Altar laid down that night. He had dreams of his family. He had dreams of King Arthur, of knights, of battles, of ogres, of wizards, of all sorts of strange things. And when he opened his eyes the next day to a bright blue sky and the chirping of birds, 
His heart wasn't as light as it should have been, but he was ready to face what would come next. And that, Alden, is the first part of this new story about the sword and the stone and King Arthur. There will be more parts, but I wanted to get back into the rhythm of telling the stories just so I could. Good night, I love you, and I will see you soon.